Hey gang, Uncle Todd and Sonny here. And it's time for us to put on our top hats or something equivalent as we head back to Victorian England and look at uh, a film starring Boris Karloff back during his 50s resurgence, renaissance, whatever you call it. Uh, in the early 50s, after his heyday in the 30s and 40s, he had kind of transferred to being a sporting player in films like The Black Castle, along with Lon Chaney Jr., and The Strange Door with Charles Lawton, where he was a sporting player, either in league with bad guys or trying to help the good guys. Then, shock theater hit TV screens. Uh, this was the whole birth of the horror host, which was a carryover from the radio days of anthologies, where you had a mysteriously voiced host to introduce and close out the st stories. And uh, with the shock theater package, which included a lot of his universal films, like Frankenstein, The Mummy, Bride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, uh, The Invisible Ray, and some of his 40 films like Black Friday, basically all the Frankenstein films, and the Dracula films, and Universal put them all through. So, Karloff was back in the public's eye, and he was getting starring roles. A lot of them were not the best. I mean, you had Voodoo Island, uh, Island Monster, Frankenstein 1970. But, you know, Karloff being Karloff, he just liked to work. If it wasn't the best, so be it. He also did TV at this time. He had a failed uh, show called The Veil, in which he introduced two story, true stories of the supernatural, and would even appear in them except for one episode that was actually from England and about Jack the Ripper. But um, it never sold, and even worse, he never even got paid for it. Then, enter Richard Gordon, who uh, was making horror films in England. He had already worked with Bela Lugosi in Old Mother Riley Meets the Vampire, which... Uh, unfortunately did not play over here until after Lugosi's death and was renamed My Son the Vampire and had an Alan Sherman song over the credits. But he also made such films as Fiend Without a Face, the famous brain monster movie that, uh, if you've ever seen it, you know, wow, for the special effects of that time. Wow. And First Man Into Space was another one. Yeah, he had a lot of really good films he produced, and he got a deal with Karloff to go over to England and make two, which are considered his best 50s films. Uh, there was Quarter of Blood, in which he starred along with Christopher Lee. A real uh, passing of the torch, as it were, kind of uh, thing, although they didn't share too many scenes together. And this one. The Haunted Strangler, which, in my opinion, is his best film of the 50s. And uh, he would continue into the 60s, of course, uh, working for Roger Corman and AIP in um, The Raven with Vincent Price, The Terror with a young Jack Nicholson, and Ghost in the Invisible Bikini with uh, The Beach Party Gang. And then his great last real awesome film, Targets, for Peter Bogdanovich, who was a Corman protege before he ended his career with four Mexican-based films where he filmed his scenes in Los Angeles and then they were intercut into the film. He would have maybe 15 minutes of screen time each film. But he said he wanted to die in harness otherwise known as 
dying with your boots on. He wanted to work until he died. He loved acting that much. Didn't matter what the role was. He just liked acting. Well, getting to the Haunted Strangler. We open in 1860, where a crowd has gathered to watch a man called the uh, Haymarket Strangler be hanged. Yeah, people love a spectacle. Public hangings were always a big event in the past. Don't know what that says about us. Moving on, while the uh, now deceased uh, convicted murderer is being packed in quicklime, uh, the doctor who was, you know, there to perform, you know, he's dead, da 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 does something strange. Wonder why he did that. Hmm. <laughs> well, no time to ponder. He does something rather sad at the uh, actual burial. Dr. Tennant's fainted. Quick, give us a hand. You would think, being a doctor and all, he could handle a funeral. Anyway, we jump 20 years ahead to, oh, sorry, 1880, where we are introduced to James Rankin, a.k.a. Boris Karloff. He's a writer, social, um, uh, what they call it back then, reformer, uh, in which he's investigating the uh, conviction. The conviction and execution of the man accused of being the Haymarket Strangler. He's wanting to have the case looked into as part of his overall attempt to revamp uh, the uh, justice system at that time. I've been back over the records and given you at least a dozen cases. Why on earth choose this one? It's the one clear case that'll prove my point. If Stiles had had the money to buy an adequate defense, he never would have hanged. Yes, sharp eye viewers, that is Anthony Dawson, famous for being in Dr. No as an evil doctor, not the Dr. No, and for playing Blofeld, uncredited, in both From Russia With Love and Thunderball. Anyway, his whole thing is wanting to have everybody get legal counsel. Kind of like we have today. Which wasn't a thing back then. You only got a lawyer if you could afford it. So, he's most interested in Dr. Tennant, the man who passed out. Uh, he disappeared. He went to a hospital and disappeared after his breakdown. He also makes mention of the fact that the knife the Haymarket Strangler used, is supposedly used, was never found. A key piece of evidence. His technique was to first strangle. Uh, the accused man only had one arm. So his, um, after he strangled them, he would then take his knife and cut them for some reason. Or slash. So, his next step is off to the hospital where Tennant had been. Where he learns from the records, Tennant had... Uh, been prone to spells where he would become violent and his arm would be his left arm would become paralyzed but then he would snap out of it and he'd be okay and this sparks in uh, Rankin the idea that 
Maybe the witness who identified the uh, condemned man assumed it was him because he only had one arm, but could have mistaken it for a man with a paralyzed arm. Anyway, he does find out that uh, they do still have Dr. Tennant's belongings. Scandal? What sort of scandal? Well, the young nurse who ran away with him. The doctors all said he was mad. She thought she knew better. And when the asylum van came, no patient, no nurse. Scandal indeed. Now, you're going to need to remember that because it's going to be important later. Which I'm sure you can already guess what that might be. But we'll see. Uh, back at home, they're, uh, oh, they allow him to take the belongings for a bit. He's going to have to return them eventually, but uh, taking them home, we are then shown that his daughter and his assistant are a little more than just friends. Ken, you must never return to Canada. I couldn't bear it. Unless you come with me as my wife. But that won't be for years. Not until you've completed your studies. Psychological medicine seems such a big thing. What's a horror flick without a little romance? Oh, but remember that thing about psychological medicine? It seems he's a bit of a trailblazer himself. That'll become important later. Meanwhile, um, Rankin, who uh, almost interrupts them, I mean, they're already separated by that point, brings in the effects where he and his assistant McCall make a startling discovery. The usual paraphernalia, stethoscope, surgical dressing, and an instrument case from which a surgeon's knife is missing. Jinkies! A clue! Very funny. <laughs> um. Well, this is furthering his theory that Tennant may have actually been the Haymarket Strangler. Now they are off to see the witness, who still works at the uh, dance hall that she was at 20 years ago. Uh, now a headliner instead of just in the chorus. Um, I guess this is what uh, we would have called burlesque. Dancing, singing, and women in short skirts. <laughs> wow, pretty saucy for the time. Well, Rankin uh, gets a meeting with the witness, while one of the younger dancers uh, takes a shine to McCall. Come here. I haven't thanked you yet for taking that lout off my hand. Oh, it was a pleasure. There. That was nice, wasn't it? Come on. Never mind about that now. He does get some interesting information about Dr. Tennant, though. Just something in the way he looked at you. When he touched you, it was... Anyway, didn't want me. It was Martha Stewart he was after. So, Dr. Tennant had been interested in the Haymarket Strangler's last victim. Well, when he asks if she is sure she identified the right man, she gets a little offended by it. Are you sure that it was Styles? Are you calling me a liar? The face. Did you see the face? I didn't have to see his face. I could tell that one on that one anywhere. Well, can't blame her. Hard to make someone think that 20 years late ago they made a wrong identification and sent an innocent man to the gallows. Ah, well, returning home, both the men theorize. McCall theorizes, thanks to his psychological studying, that Tenet may have had these fits of homicidal rage in which his arm would become paralyzed 
and then, when the fit passed, have no memory of it. Rankin's after a more tangible theory. He believes Tennant hid the knife in Styles' grave. So, he goes to his friend, the policeman, to get an exclamation order. He's refused. He goes to the warden of the jail, or the prison, where Styles has been buried, and is refused, at which point he inadvertently comes upon a man being whipped as punishment for some infraction, and the sight of the blood on the man's back causes him to pass out, at which point, when he wakes up, one of the guards has a proposition for him. They don't use that graveyard. Not once in weeks. Now, if someone was to let you in the gate late at night, someone would knew where the coffin lay. Are you suggesting that you would... Of course, there'd have to be a consideration for his trouble beforehand. So, an agreement is made. Rushing home to get things uh, ready, he walks in at an inopportune moment. When I gave you the freedom of my house, I expected you to observe certain decencies. Well, sir, I was going to... But, Father, we're going to marry. Really? Seems he's a little peeved that nobody thought to tell him about this. Until it's brought to his attention that his wife, her mother, has been trying to talk to him about it for days, but he keeps brushing her off and running out. Actually, she'd like him to stop doing all this and relax. The stress... It's starting to get to him, she thinks. Well, no time for that now. He wishes them well and uh, gets some stuff together and heads back out to the cemetery where, after getting directions, he digs up the grave and has success. Unfortunately, his contact with the knife has a rather strange effect. He has been transformed into a homicidal killer with a paralyzed arm. Not unlike Carlos's uh, evil twin in the Black Room back in 35. Or was that 34? Regardless. <clears throat> At this point, the now killer, who perhaps is possessed by the spirit of Styles, who might have actually been the Haymarket Strangler, he goes back to the music hall where he waits until Pearl is alone. You know, the one who was make, trying to make time with McCall, who wants to marry his daughter. And, well, I think you can guess what happens to her. <laughs> that accomplished. He tries to make his escape, which does not go off without a hitch. The next day, Rankin is just worn out. He was screaming from a nightmare. His wife is really worried. She wants him to drop the whole thing. But when uh, McCall comes in and says uh, the inspector has wanted to see uh, Rankin at the scene of the latest murder. Murder? What murder? And of course, that gets explained to him, and then he says, I'll be, uh, let me get ready. 
and he apologizes to his wife. He's committed. He has to see this through. Then at the scene of the crime, the witness doesn't seem to recognize Rankin as the killer. She thinks it's a ghost. I don't know anymore. I, I don't know. It was just as though Styles had come back to life again. It was the same man, the very same man. I tell you that if you brought me face to face with him now. It was the Haymarket Strangler. The real reason Burke had called in Rankin was, it seems his theory about Tennant is correct. He knows more about this case than anyone. He wants them to come back to the office, go through all the evidence they've got, and he should be able to point to who Tennant is now. Because, you know, he spent all that time. <sighs> Unfortunately, he can't find anything that could point to Tennant, where Tennant could be now. Although he is starting to get an inkling of a scary idea. And he wants to check it before he tells Burke. So he goes home and starts talking to his wife. It seems Rankin's memory only goes back 20 years. Uh, the previous years, total blank. He's beginning to suspect why that is. It's life, but now I must know. You must tell me. Who is the man you took from Guy's hospital? Don't ask me that, Jim. Is it an answer that I know myself? The inevitable end of my search that I myself am the man that I've been hunting? You were so young. And in the periods when you were yourself, so gentle and kind. Always, when you were in my care, I fell in love with you. I had to create a, another man. Always afraid we might be discovered. I didn't know then that you were a murderer. Now that you do? The decision's no longer in my hands, Jim. Yep. Love will make you do crazy things. Oh. Uh, Lily is not actually his daughter. Barbara was a young widow with a small child when she met and fell in love with Tennant. Rankin, as he is now, has been raising her as if she was his own. He feels as if she is his daughter and she feels as if he is her father. Unfortunately for Barbara, all this agitation has caused Rankin to start toying with the knife. And we know what happens when he touches that knife. What's the matter? <laughs> Thinking quickly, he hides the knife then makes his escape, although he is seen by their housekeeper, Hannah. The next morning, when he comes back home, with no knowledge of what he's done, he's informed his wife has been killed by the Haymarket Strangler, which causes him to immediately confess. But he has trouble proving what he says is true. Now, who was it you saw? I don't know. Was it Mr. Rankin? It was too dark to see properly. He was more like... A beast than a human being. Not a gentleman like Mr. Rankin. Did you admit him to the prison again? Well, what reason would I have, sir? Respect him. I want a straight like... answer. Yes or no? Never set eyes on him since, sir. There you are, sir. Fresh earth. Well? See for yourself, sir. Jim Moxon, the child murderer. We buried him last week. Well. Taking him back home, it's believed that uh, the stress of overwork mixed with his wife's murder has caused him to have a bit of a psychotic break. 
they bring in a qualified doctor to examine him and when the doctor doesn't believe him he attacks him which gets him committed and an asylum back then is not a nice place to be and he's treated pretty poorly they even have to put him in a straitjacket but uh, when his other personality uh, emerges it proves no match for such a flimsy thing as a straitjacket. Anyway, breaking the glass bulb over the um, gas lamp that's in the wall, he uh, uses the flame to set his bedding on fire. And with a nice shard of glass in his hand, he waits for one of the guards to come in. Ah, he uh, makes his escape from the cell, beats up another couple of guards on the way out, and uh, ends up in the kitchen, where after hiding in the food cupboard, he uh, decides to get one more victim before he exits the asylum. I played a very long otter, so he cut his... <laughs> We then get a spirited chase through the countryside, where he heads back to town and his house. Ah, but Burke knows that's obviously where he's heading and sets up guards. Ah, but the Haymarket Strangler is no fool. Thinking quickly, he attacks Hannah with her screams drawing the police away from the house. He runs in, locks the door, retrieves his knife and sets his sights on Lily. Now back to normal, he apologizes to Lily, asks for her forgiveness, at which point Burke breaks in and asks Rankin to give himself up. Rankin's amenable to that, but he feels there's something he must do first. The knife. It must go back to the grave. I must put it there. So, it's a race to the cemetery where Rankin tries to dig up the body to return the knife. But he's prevented by the arrival of Burke, the warden, and the guards. And, uh, well, that one guy he bribed isn't too keen on uh, what's going on here. Burke, I charge you. Bury this knife. Shoot. Ah! Hold it! We end on a most poignant moment between these two friends. I'll see the knife's destroyed, Rankin. Tell you back. It belongs here with me. Quite the ending. This, of course, is Karloff's show all the way. He runs the full gamut of his talent. Congenial loving husband. 
congenial loving father. Obsessed academic. Stressed out man who's worrying about what it is he could possibly be getting into. Sad resignation. And of course, homicidal mania. Oh, that look he has as the killer. He achieved that the same way he got that sunken face look in the original Frankenstein. Uh, he had a partial plate head for many, many years due to being poor, not getting good food and stuff. And he had a partial plate that he would take out and would give him this sunken appearance along his one side. And then just, you know, his other facial expressions just kind of completed it. And rather ingenuity and a combination of talent. And considering this is a low-budget film, as most of Richard Gordon's films were, it saved on the budget for having to do heavy makeup. And of course, you know, that paralyzed arm again. He'd done that uh, before. Uh, in uh, the Black Room, he played two brothers. A good brother who had a paralyzed arm that he held like that. And then his evil brother who kills the good brother and then passes himself off as the good brother and would just hold it like this. Anyway, yeah, Karloff's great in this. It's a really good story with a really interesting mystery as he digs deeper into this past, even though we ourselves are pretty sure since it's Karloff, he could be. He's the killer. Although, he has played good guys before, so there is just that little bit of uh, thinking that maybe he's not the killer. But we'll think he is for a little bit. But it'll turn out to be someone else. You know, but nope, this is... He's the killer, and he is marvelous at it. It's always amazed me that such a gentle man in real life, and he was considered a very gentle individual. His favorite pastimes? Gardening? Reading stories to children. He was very big on that. He did a lot of uh, recordings uh, for records where he would read fairy tales and stories like Peter the Wolf. And, of course, a uh, he, uh, he put out several albums where he just told stories and uh, some like, uh, well, I've played some of the stories he's recited on uh, my uh, online radio station. And, uh, of course, he also did like Peter and the Wolf and Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Rip Van Winkle, all that kind of stuff. Uh, amazing that such a a general person could play so horrendous characters. Uh, no wonder he was the number one horror star for over 30 years. I mean, from even before Frankenstein, he played some nasty villains, especially in Howard Hawks's uh, The Criminal Code, which is, I think... Uh, well, there's several stories of how he came to James Well's attention. Uh, the one Karloff likes to tell is that he ran into him in the commissary when they were casting uh, for Frankenstein. He'd been working on something else, and Wells wanted him to come in for a screen test. And he was like, oh, you know, here in my best suit, probably looking the best I've ever been, and he wants me in a movie. And, oh, Frankenstein monster. Well, job's a job. But there are others that think he saw the criminal code, saw him in that role where he played a nasty individual, and thought, that's the guy to play Frankenstein. Yeah, depends on who you ask. Anyway, uh, the rest of the cast is pretty good. The uh, romantic leads are fine. Uh, they don't intrude too much on the story, and they each have uh, some bearing on the plot as one of his first victims is the dance hall girl that uh, was playing up to his daughter's fiance. And so still, in his mind, he is still protective of his family, even though 
in a fit of rage he kills his wife which I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons he went so manic towards the end and then he tries to kill his stepdaughter but he can't do it he's, he's caused too much pain you know Anthony Dawson who I've only ever seen play villains he, he was another villain in uh, the Italian film Operation Kid Brother, which brought together a lot of Bond alumni, along with Bernard Lee and uh, uh, I think it's Lois Nettle. Oh, I'll look it up later. Uh, and a few, and of course, uh, oh jeez, the guy who played uh, the villain Thunderball. Uh, again, I'll look it up. I'm getting off track here, but, uh, and, uh, the actresses are, uh, the dance hall girls and Pearl, they're all good. It, it's a well-acted, well-produced film, and it's probably the highlight of Karloff's, uh, career renaissance, and, oh, animal attack, ah! <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it just, it's a great film, good suspense, good mystery, and Karloff at his best. Highly recommended. Uh, please hit like, share, and subscribe. And uh, please stay after the credits for my favorite scene.